It's 1775, and the plains of North America have been thrust into war. From Lexington to Yorktown, brother will fight brother as the once loyal 13 colonies fight for the mother country or for liberty and a new era. This is the story of the American Revolution. Join us as we explore the key battles, the strategies and the politics that will one day lead to the birth of a nation. Over 150 years before the Battle of Lexington and the shots that will start the American Revolution, Europeans first begin colonizing the Americas. They settle in places like Jamestown and Quebec, and by the 1750s, the colonies have transformed from precarious trading posts to vast and complicated settlements divided by the leading powers of Europe. The British colonists bring with them a democratic tradition and fundamental rights, won over hundreds of years of warfare and rebellion. And with a high proportion of landowners, 60% of the male European population are eligible to vote, a far higher number compared to Britain. Most of the 13 colonies have appointed or elected royal governors who are nominally in charge, their power being checked by local representative assemblies and councils. The elected assemblies decide on issues from local tax to militia budgets, but new laws, including the levying of new taxes, are also issued from Parliament in London, who perceive their authority over the colonies as absolute. In 1756, the first truly global conflict erupts the Seven Years' War, with North America becoming a key battleground between Great Britain and her old enemy, France. Both sides rely heavily on native allies. The colonial militias are also vital for the British in gaining an upper hand in the conflict, who now play a leading role in shaping their future on the continent. Although the British prevail and become the undisputed power in North America, they end the conflict financially ruined and increasingly expect the colonies to burden some of the financial costs of their defence. But because they see colonists as already represented in Parliament by virtue of being British subjects, they equally see no reason to consult the colonial governments directly on how to raise these funds. Many in Great Britain are angered by the idea of taxing British subjects without formal representation in Parliament, as many of the colonists desire. This includes Britain's wartime leader during the Seven Years' War, William Pitt, who tells the House of Commons in 1766, It is my opinion that this kingdom has no right to lay a tax upon the colonies. It cannot continue a century. If it does not drop, it must be amputated. In the colonies, the levying of new taxes without consent is becoming a serious grievance. And although loyal to the king, George III, many colonists view their rights as Englishmen, including having a local representative government, as being ignored by an out of touch and duplicious parliament 3,000 miles away. After several failed attempts at raising revenue in the 1760s, anger and resistance begin to rise to Parliament's meddling throughout the colonies. In 1767, the government in London attempts to demonstrate its power through a series of laws known as the Townsend Acts, which it hopes will raise much-needed funds and crucially pave the way for future laws that will make the colonies financially self-sufficient. The plans backfire, and the Townsend Acts only pour fuel onto the fire. In Boston, riots break out, leading to the deployment of the regular army to protect local officials. Tensions boil over in the city, and an angry crowd provokes soldiers into firing. Five colonists lay dead 
in what will soon become known as the Boston Massacre. Although the soldiers, known locally as regulars, are removed from Boston, tensions in the city remain high. Three years later, to protest laws that undercut the price of smuggled tea, Bostonians dressed as Native Americans board East India Company ships and pour 9,000 pounds of goods into the harbour. The British government's reaction is swift and severe. To send a message across the colonies, they introduce what will soon become known as the Intolerable Acts, which includes replacing self-governance in Massachusetts with direct British control. However, instead of discouraging further acts of rebellion, the Intolerable Acts lead to the First Continental Congress in October 1774. In the city of Philadelphia, delegates meet from across the colonies to discuss a united response. Those who desire independence, known as patriots, are still in the minority, as most representatives still do not want a break from the crown. But Parliament's arrogance must be confronted, and a resolution is made to boycott British goods until the intolerable acts are repealed. In Boston, more extreme measures are taken. The now disbanded Colonial Assembly forms the Massachusetts Provincial Congress and starts training a militia for war. Massachusetts is declared to be an open rebellion by the new British authorities, who occupy the city of Boston, but little else. The scene is set for a showdown between Parliament and the colonies. British General Thomas Gage is dispatched to Boston to take command of the quickly deteriorating situation. He knows the land well, having fought the French in North America years earlier alongside colonists like George Washington. Although suppressing rebellions and fighting wars in different continents is nothing new to the British Army, few of Gage's 4,000 men have seen actual combat. The general quickly begins regular patrols across the countryside from his headquarters in Boston, in a show of force to the Rebel Provincial Congress and to boost the morale of his own beleaguered forces. But General Gage does not want war, and he plans to prevent it by capturing or destroying military supplies in lightning raids across Massachusetts. These raids have limited success and mostly serve to help better organize the colonial militias, with many units now being designated as Minutemen, who are able to rapidly respond to British movements. Confrontations between British regulars and colonial forces remain bloodless, and where the forces do meet, they only trade insults, with the occasional fistfight breaking out. The regulars are used to seeing armed militia protests, which are a common feature of colonial life, where locals demonstrate their rights as Englishmen as opposed to threatening violence. In March 1775, however, the more radical Massachusetts Provincial Congress decides that any large British force leaving Boston is now to be opposed with armed resistance. At the same time, Gage receives his own escalatory orders from an intransigent government in London to disarm the colonial militias and imprison the ringleaders, setting the two sides on a collision course. Gage hatches a plan to capture the rebel leadership and large military stores in the nearby town of Concord. In one fast and secret expedition, he hopes to deal a fatal blow to the nascent colonial revolt. He prepares a small force of 700 men under Lieutenant Colonel Smith, giving him strict instructions to respect the rights of local inhabitants and their private property, but also to request reinforcements if resistance is met. But the Massachusetts rebels have been expecting such a move, and the evening before the raid, patriots catch wind of the plans in Boston and ride out to warn the Congress leadership and militias, narrowly avoiding British patrols.
Because the land route to Concord is closely watched by rebel sympathisers, in the early hours of the 19th of April, Smith's force row across the bay in an attempt to maintain the element of surprise. They disembark into waist-deep water and by 2am begin their 18-mile march to Concord in soaking boots. Because no resistance is expected, to speed up their movements, each soldier is carrying limited ammunition a decision that would prove disastrous later in the day. As the British march, colonial riders are spotted moving west ahead of the column. Smith then hears reports from his forward units that large militia forces are gathering at Lexington, unnerving news which quickly spreads throughout the ranks. Smith knows they've lost the element of surprise and sends word back to Boston asking for reinforcements. As British forces arrive in Lexington, the town's militia is present. As with previous confrontations, neither side expect bloodshed, and the militia of 80 men, under the command of John Parker, is purposefully not blocking the road to Concord or intending to fight regular troops. Parker tells his men, Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Without orders, a British advance guard moves on to Lexington Common instead of marching past to Concord. Commanders on both sides tell their men not to fire and the militia is told to disperse. 100 local spectators watch on curiously as the two forces casually hurl insults at each other. As the militiamen slowly begin to leave, a single shot rings out from somewhere on the surrounding common. In the immediate confusion, other shots start to be fired from both sides until the British company volley fires without orders. Although those on the field do not yet know it, the first blood has been spilt of the American Revolutionary War and eight militiamen lay dead on Lexington Common. Smith regains control of the situation and berates his stunned officers, reminding them of Gage's orders. The troops are recalled and the march continues apace to Concord. The day is young, and Smith hopes they can still complete their mission, despite the unwelcomed setback at Lexington. Upon arrival into Concord, the British search buildings where residents give them permission and burn the small amounts of contraband they can find. But there are no rebel leaders or large military stores, as anything in any one of value has been dispersed hours earlier by the rebels. By 9am, 400 colonial militia have concentrated in the surrounding hills under the command of Colonel Barrett. They have heard rumours of the events at Lexington and now see smoke coming from Concord. Assuming that the regulars are burning the town, many are surprised and angered by the apparent escalation, but they are not afraid to meet fire with fire. The exhausted British regulars resting in the town are still unaware of the dramatic change of sentiment or of the large numbers of militia that are slowly surrounding their position. Now watched on by the evacuated townspeople, Barrett and the militia resolve to save the town and they advance. Barrett's force quickly rout the 90 regulars holding the bridge, but lightly stunned by both the escalation and their success, they fall back to the hill and regroup. There are now over 1,000 militia surrounding Concord, and Smith knows it is time to leave. The regulars spread out beyond the road for protection and start the march back towards Lexington, but columns of militia are ominously shadowing their movements, and a race begins to the first bridge. The situation has now seriously changed for Smith and his men, who were perilously outnumbered and far away from the safety of Boston Harbour. Shots start to ring out and the regulars take casualties as they cross the bridge. British skirmishers attempt to flank the militia, who position themselves well behind walls, trees and undergrowth. Those they catch are killed, but most of the militiamen have spent years fighting and living in the rugged terrain of North America and deliver disciplined and effective musket fire before moving position. 
As the speed of march increases in sheer desperation, the regulars are repeatedly ambushed by the now over 2,000 strong militia. Casualties are starting to mount as the British tactical formations are no use in the wooded countryside and what little ammunition they have starts to run low. They spread out where they can, but at narrow passes, like at the now infamous Bloody Angle, discipline and cohesion starts to break down as the force fights for its life. The Lexington militia under Parker, who were scattered by the British just eight hours earlier, are now back and ready for revenge. Parker prepares his men well in a wooded hill overlooking the road. As they open fire, the British commander, Lieutenant Colonel Smith, is hit in the leg and falls from his horse, wounded. Desperate fighting continues up to a last ambush outside of Lexington, where the British, now exhausted from 14 hours of marching and fighting, are on the verge of surrender. Smith and his men stagger into town, defeated by their superior tactics, tenacity and the sheer numbers of colonial militia. But just as all hope seems lost, cheers erupt in the British ranks. Smith's message for reinforcements has been answered. Under the command of Earl Percy, 1,000 British regulars are now surrounding Lexington with two field guns. Percy, taking overall command, reorganizes Smith's battered force and rests them in the town. But the battle is not over, and although reinforced, the British are still hopelessly outnumbered by the now 4,000 strong colonial militia, who show no signs of being cowed by the presence of British reinforcements. Percy soon continues the march, with Smith's battered formation in the middle of the column. A militia general, William Heath, arrives to take overall command of the colonial forces. He orders the militia to now avoid large British formations because of the threat posed by the deadly field guns. Heath's forces must continually rotate to engage the British along the road, a time-consuming and difficult maneuver to carry out. Desperate street fighting and bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat occurs as the British column enters the town of Monotony. Some atrocities are committed by the desperate and frightened British troops as each building is cleared of sharpshooters. Many are killed on both sides in monotony, including one militiaman who dies fighting from his home, telling his comrades an Englishman's home is his castle. The militia has large forces organized and waiting at Cambridge, but Percy decides instead to march towards Charlestown, rightfully cautious of a trap. As the final hill is cleared of militia, the British column limps into Charlestown, to the safety of Boston Harbour and Royal Navy guns. The first battle of the American Revolution is over, and although it saw relatively minor casualties on both sides, the battle is nonetheless monumental. The war has now begun, and as the Patriot leader, John Adams, later writes, the die is cast and the Rubicon crossed. In the aftermath of the battle, and in what must have felt like the world turning upside down, trenches and redouts are dug around the city, and Boston is put to siege. In the days and weeks following the battle, volunteers from all over the 13 colonies march to join the army, and the militia transforms into a truly American force for the first time. Although they may lack the equipment and the professionalism of a modern army, they have nonetheless succeeded in their first test of what will soon become a gruelling war. General Gage's strategy to prevent conflict has dramatically failed, along with the British government's plan to force colonial compliance without the consent of its people. In London, Parliament quickly blames Gage for recklessly starting a civil conflict despite the fact he was following their orders. And even as the shots at Lexington are heard around the world, Parliament's position will not budge, and British reinforcements are soon dispatched to the colonies. What started out as civil and legal arguments over rights and taxation has now transformed into outright war in Massachusetts. The opening battle has ended in colonial victory, 
But the battle at Lexington is just the beginning and the British will soon strike back. Thank you for watching our series on the American Revolution. Join us again soon for future videos. And if you liked our channel and want to support us grow, please consider liking and subscribing. Until next time.